Thank you, choir. Good job. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. And as you're turning there in your Bibles, let me just say, I don't pick the passages God tells me to preach. I just do what the boss tells me to do. And we're going to be looking at Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And let's look at this text as we come to it in the scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, we ask your anointing, your blessing. Upon the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of your perfect word. And we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In his book, Why Men Rebel, Ted Gurr explains why riots, rebellions, and civil wars occur. He makes a lot of interesting observations in his book, but his most interesting observation, in my opinion, is his claim that the primary cause of rebellion is discontent. He says that discontent arises from a feeling that people are being deprived of something they expect to receive. He says that people become discontent when they are denied that which they feel entitled. I think he's right. I think he's right on the money. Nothing makes us more angry than injustice. We've been looking at some of the great rescues of the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And we're going to continue that this morning as we look at how God rescued the people of Israel from poisonous snakes. I don't like snakes. Maybe a better way to say this was God rescued his people from themselves. You see, God demands obedience. God demands obedience. And anytime we forget that, good reason, bad reason, doesn't matter. Anytime we forget that God demands obedience, there's a price to pay. And sometimes that price is higher than we would like to think. In fact, sometimes we would think that that price is unfair. So what can we learn as we begin this new year about the importance of obeying God? We're going to look at three truths about the consequences of rebellion in this passage this morning. First of all, let's look at the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Look at Numbers 21, verses 4 through 6. Then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. In order to understand this story, we have to understand the context in which it lies. The people of Israel had been making their way from bondage in Egypt to the promised land, and they came to Mount Or. 
Then they proceeded from Mount Or to the land of Edom. Now, you've got to understand that this whole area, Mount Or, Edom, the wilderness of um, Zin, um, the area of Kadesh, you have to understand this whole area is desert, is wilderness. It was then and it is now. If you go and you look at pictures of this area today, it's just nothing, nothingness. It looks like the surface of the moon. It's desert. It's wilderness, barren desert. Numbers 20, verses 14 through through 21, tells us how Moses sent messengers to the Edomites to negotiate a way for the children of Israel to pass through their land. But the Edomites said, no. They said, you will not pass through our land no matter what. And if you try, we're going to send an army and there's going to be a war and you're going to lose. The Edomites said, no. Under any circumstances, would they allow the people of Israel to pass through their land so the children of Israel had to turn around and return to Mount Or? And as they were returning to Mount Or, they passed through Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, and the people had no water, and they were thirsty. As a matter of fact, Numbers 20 and verse 1 tells us that Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, died there. It's interesting, it's fitting that the name Miriam means rebellion because, of, because that's exactly what was about to happen. Because they were thirsty, the Bible says the people of Israel gathered together against Moses and Aaron. They complained about their circumstances and they attacked their leaders. And the Bible says that Moses and Aaron sought the face of God. And the Bible says God revealed his glory to them. And God told them to take their rod and to go to the rock that was before them and speak to it. And out of that rock would come a flow of drinking water. Understand, God was prepared. God was ready to meet the needs of the people of Israel. All they had to do was speak to this rock, and God would give clean, fresh water in the middle of a desert. But Moses and Aaron, they were fed up. No doubt, they were grieving the death of their sister, who had apparently died of thirst in the desert. They were probably angry at God for taking her, they were tired and thirsty themselves, and you know they were sick and tired of this complaining people. Listen, we say all the time, Moses led the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Read the first five books of the Bible. No, he didn't. He dragged them out, kicking and screaming. They were complaining all the way. Just read the book of Exodus. They were complaining all the way. And you know that Moses and Aaron were sick and tired of a people that were constantly complaining against them when they should have been supporting them. And Moses and Aaron were fed up. So instead of speaking to the rock, the Bible says they spoke to the people. <laughs> oh, we'll speak all right, God, but it won't be to, to a rock. We'll speak to those stiff-necked people of yours. And the Bible says instead of speaking to the rock, they spoke to the people. They called them rebels. And then if, instead of speaking to the rock, they hit it with their rod. And right then and right there, God told Moses and Aaron that they would not enter the promised land. And guess what? They didn't. Aaron died on Mount Or, Numbers 20, verse 28. Moses died on Mount Nebo, Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. Neither one of the two made it to the promised land. You 
see, you can't rebel against God and expect a blessing in your life. You can't be disobedient against God and expect Him to bless your life. So Moses found himself leading a complaining, ungrateful people while mourning the deaths of his sister and now his brother. And the Edomites wouldn't let them pass. So as they made their way around Edom, they faced another obstacle. This time it was the king of Arad, the Canaanite. In Numbers 21, verse 2, Israel made a vow to the Lord that if the Lord would give them victory over King Arad, that they would utterly destroy the city of Canaan. And so they did. God gave Israel a a great victory, and Israel destroyed the city and the people of Canaan. And here's where our story picks up. As they continue to attract to the promised land, the Bible says the soul of the people became discouraged. And they began to complain once again against God and against Moses. But this time was different. This time they went too far. They complained about being thirsty, something they had done before. But this time, they complained against the manna. They called it worthless bread. Now understand, God is full of grace and mercy. He's holy. But to complain against the grace of a holy God is not only sinful, it's foolish. It's dumb. As we begin a new year, we need to remember God is holy and he's just. We need, to, we need to remember that we're dealing with a holy and a righteous God who will judge us when we're disobedient. Secondly, let's consider the importance of repentance. Verse 7, Numbers 21, verse 7. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Here we see in this passage, we see two very important Old Testament types of Christ. We see the serpent and we see the bread. Both are emphasized in the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In John chapter 6, beginning in verse 32, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So while the people of Israel were wandering in the desert, they had been kept alive by the manna, the bread, that God miraculously provided for them every morning. One day's supply at a time. So when they referred to the bread of God as worthless, they, as Jesus pointed out in John chapter 6, they were calling God worthless. If 
folks, you don't do that. You can't do that without consequences. You can't curse God and continue to curse God through word or deed without consequences in our lives. So God sent poisonous snakes to bite them and to kill them. You see, ironically, their their venom, their hate, their anger toward God led to the judgment of God. Ironically, God gave venom for venom. And only after they began to feel the effect of the judgment of God did they repent. Only after they began to feel the heat, the pain, the judgment, did they repent. And when they repented, they repented of both the way they had treated God and the way they treated Moses. There's a message there. We can't treat God and we can't treat his ordained leaders with disrespect and then expect a blessing from God. God doesn't bless that. But he does bless godly, genuine repentance. So their leader, so Moses interceded for them and prayed for them that God would remove his judgment. And there's a lesson. God does bless an honest, repentant heart. God blesses an honest, <clears throat> repentant heart. Thirdly, let's look at the blessing of forgiveness. The sweet blessing of forgiveness. Look at verses 8 and 9. Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone... When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. The people repented. Moses interceded. And God forgave. That's the recipe for forgiveness. That's the recipe for revival. In our lives as individuals, as in, in our lives as families, in our life as a church, in our community, in our city, in our country, in our world. That's the recipe. For revival. This plague of snakes seems to have come on quickly and then spread quickly. The Bible goes out of its way to tell us these were horrible snakes. The word for fiery in verse 6 it refers to their bites. Apparently, the bites of these snakes were extremely painful and led to an agonizing death. But the people repented. And God forgave. But I want you to notice the, the remedy. And this is the most important part. Notice the remedy. Most of all, it was slow. Agonizing and slow. God told Moses to make a fiery serpent and put it on a pole. And the Bible says, and Moses made a bronze serpent, and he put it on a pole. Now, where were they? Remember? They're in the middle of a desert. They're in the middle of wilderness. Can you imagine 
how long it would have taken to have fired a furnace, if they even had a furnace, and then make the mold, and then melt the bronze, and then fashion the serpent. Believe me, as someone who used to make their living working with metals, even with modern day technology, this wouldn't happen overnight. This would have taken time. And all the while, these snakes are crawling, and they're biting, and they're killing. They're everywhere. The message is the consequences of our sins last much longer than any of us would like to think. Even if we're saved, many times we'll continue to reap what we've sown. in our lives. But the process gets slower. To slow the the remedy down even further, I'm sure that Moses had to be very, very careful here. The lay leaders of Israel had to be very, very careful. Do you remember the second commandment? You remember the second of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not make any graven image. Well, what was God commanding Moses to do? Sounds like make a graven image. It sounds like that's exactly what God was calling Moses to do. So Moses had to make sure that he was hearing from God. And that he was doing the right thing. You ever seen the James Bond movie where where he's working on defusing the bomb and if he cuts the wrong wire, it's over? (laughs) Well, that's the picture here. Moses had to make sure that he's hearing right. I don't know about Moses, but I know that when I have to make sure that I'm hearing right, I have to get away. And I have to get quiet, and I have to be still, and I have to listen to God carefully. And that takes time. I'm sure it took Moses time. And all the while, those snakes were crawling, and they're biting, and they're killing. To make things even worse, God called Moses to make an image of a snake. And snakes are the very image of evil. I mean, the people in that day didn't like snakes any more than we like snakes. And God would, and Moses had to have been saying, Lord, you want me to make an image of what? And what about these lay leaders? What about the leaders of the people of Israel? They had to trust Moses. It would have appeared as though Moses was violating the second commandment. It would appear as though he was making a graven image to put on a pole to lift up. I mean, hello, can anyone say golden calf? Does anyone remember what happened the last time we did that? This wasn't easy. These these lay leaders had to make a decision to support their leader in the midst of a crisis. And all the while, people were suffering and dying from the bites of these snakes. So Joe's wife, Sue, and their two girls, they were both bitten last night. They died in the night. If it hadn't been for the hoe, that'd have bit my wife this morning. They're everywhere. It's taking too long. These snakes are everywhere. We've, we've already bought all of all the hoes that Home Depot and Lowe's had. <laughs> what are we gonna do? We can't keep waiting. These snakes are killing us. I know they confessed their sins. 
I know they repented, but the remedy was slow in coming. You don't call God's grace worthless. That's the point of the passage. There's some things you don't do, and that's one of them. They were paying a price for their sin, and they had to be patient. You see, when we face a crisis, we have to do three things. We have to trust God, we have to trust our leadership, and we have to be patient. Because the remedy, it just might not be overnight. It just might not be instantaneous. So how do you do that in the midst of a crisis? How do you trust God and trust your leadership? And how do you be patient when there are snakes everywhere and they're poisonous and they're dying and and all of your neighbors are dying and you might be next? You do that by going back to your calling. You do that by going back to the experience where you first surrendered your life to Christ. You do that that by going back in time to when you know that God gave you your leader. The people of Israel had to go back to their salvation from Egypt. They had to go back to their confidence in Moses, and then they had to wait. And all the while, these snakes, they're crawling, and they're biting, and they're killing. This is not an easy thing. This was a very, very tough time in the history of the people of Israel. You see, we can get into sin in a second in a heartbeat. But it might just take a lifetime to get out of it. God was teaching them and he's teaching us this morning about the nature and the danger, the seriousness of sin. Just as the people had sinned by calling God's gracious bread from heaven worthless. So God in the remedy transformed an instrument of death into a source of life. Whoever was bitten by the judgment of God, by those snakes, and looked upon the bronze serpent, the Bible says, would be healed. Notice the Bible never says the snakes would stop biting. How long did they bite? We don't know. The Bible never says the snakes would stop biting. The Bible just says God would give a remedy to save their lives. Whoever was bitten by the judgment of God and looked upon the bronze serpent would be healed. The bread in this passage, is a picture of Jesus. He is the bread of life. The bronze serpent is also a picture of Jesus. Jesus became sin for us, and he hung on the cross. And for there to be healing, and for there to be forgiveness, the manna had to be received, and the serpent had to be seen, had to be accepted. Both the serpent and the bread are symbols of the awesome, grace of a loving God. In his book, The Grace Awakening, Chuck Swindoll wrote, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. 
So God sent us a Savior. Praise God for the grace of God. And pray that we have patience as we repent of our sin, as we wait on God. Let's pray. Father, we hear you. The seriousness of sin. The danger of sin. The holiness. The righteousness of God. Oh God, forgive us. When we take your grace for granted. Father, we thank you that you made a way for us through the person, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins to be forgiven of us. We thank you for that salvation. But God, thank you for reminding us that the sting of sin is still painful. Yes, we're saved from the death, eternal death. But Father, we're not always delivered from the consequences. Give us patience as we learn, as we wait. Upon your deliverance. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you need to come and do that this morning. You need to make sure, you must make sure, that if you were to die today, you would know you'd go to heaven. You need to come. Or maybe you are a Christian and God is calling you to rededicate your life to him. Maybe God has reminded you, as he has me, of his holiness. Of the seriousness in which he takes sin. And he's calling you to come and rededicate your life. You come. Maybe God's calling you to to join this church. I don't know how he's calling, but I know that we have to be obedient. We have to obey his call. Because as we are reminded in this passage, there are consequences for disobedience. So you come as the Lord speaks. Surely come and read.